now introduce you to Ray. G'day guys. So we've brought Ray in to have a look at cartoons and collectibles each week. And this week we are actually looking at a cartoon. That's right, we looked at Doom Justice League, which was released at the end of February this year. It's loosely based on Mark Wade's story arc, JLA, Tower of Babel. Uh, it was written and adapted by Dwayne McDuffie and directed by Lauren Montgomery. Now, didn't Dwayne McDuffie pass away earlier this year? He did, sadly, yeah. Sonia, yes. And the film is actually dedicated to him. Uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he's an American writer of comic books and television, uh, Static Shock, and the animated series J League Unlimited, just a couple of his works. But he's probably most well known for his work on the animated series Ben 10, right? Absolutely, yeah. which, as we all know, has a huge fan base yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. So what's Doom about, though? Okay, uh, Justice League, uh, they consist of some of the world's finest superheroes and protectors of humanity, right? Indeed. Well, what if they went rogue? There would be a lot of trouble. That's exactly right, and that's exactly <laughs> what the Dark Knight thinks too. So, yes. Batman has been preparing this uh, top secret information, analysing their weaknesses, and as a contingency plan in case that Smart, anything eh? happened. But these secret files go missing by a rising group of super villains, and then they test the J League to their full capacity when they confront them with their weaknesses. Okay, so we have a world of trouble happening now. Yes, absolutely. Well. Although this isn't a direct sequel to Crisis on Two Words, it does use the same character animation and design by the lead designer Phil Barassa. Now the character design itself I thought was, look, the characters are definitely recognisable, yeah. but they're a bit flat, they lack a little luster. So I don't know what you thought yeah, about Yeah, no, them. I, I do tend to agree. They were just a little bit static. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought, I don't know, when I look at animation or a still, I want there to be a sense of gravity or weight in it, a, a realism. And I, I don't know, when I go to see a film, I want it to have the same uh, production values to that of its competitors. Yeah, no, I do understand. But honestly, I didn't mind it that much. It gave me a little bit of sense of nostalgia. It kind of took me back to my days of watching Batman the Animated Series. Okay. So I was willing to overlook the staticness. All right. What about the story? At the start of the film, I was willing to forego some of the animation flaws. Mm -hmm. Look, the film is PG, so what you get is a distinct difference in the psychological drama and intensity driving the piece as opposed to, I don't know, something more complex. Okay, but you're not just being a little bit racist. Racist? Yes. No, not at all. Look, <laughs> Studio Ghibli films, there, most of them are all, I think they're all PG, and yeah. look, they don't suffer from this. That's true. And then you've got something like, you know, Batman Year One, which has an M rating, and it doesn't suffer from it either. And look, at the risk of sounding condescending, I just thought that the character dilemmas were kind of simplified and that didn't sit well with me. So, you know, look, the, the J League being pitted against their nemesis is an That's awesome concept. Cool. It's very cool, yeah. but I just thought it was too much to accomplish in 72 minutes. Yeah, they did cover a lot of ground in this film. They did? And they did explore Batman's backstory really well. They did, but <laughs> given that it was his stolen research that was the catalyst for what follows, I don't know, it's kind of to be expected. Yeah, that's true. Very well, true. what did you think about Wonder Woman, though? Okay, I liked her, but mm -hmm. I wasn't completely taken by her. Mm -hmm. A lot of her actions seemed to be just defending herself with her bracelet. It yes. was really nice that they kept aiming for her bracelets. <laughs> But it just got a little repetitive and boring. Well, that's exactly what I thought too. I mean, there was a lot of action and so much so that you kind of focus on those moments and it kind of became plain. You yeah. kind of limited or uninventive. I don't know. So, Ray, it sounds like you hated this film. No, I didn't hate the film. I just have a growing dislike since <laughs> watching it. No, it, there's a lot of good things about the film. There's the soundtrack. I thought it had plenty of gusto and yes. excitement. Yeah. It drew me in. Uh, there's the Royal Flush gang. Oh, I they thought, were great. I thought they were really fun. Yeah. Uh, there's the Flash, who's probably my favourite character of the lot. Um, he's very witty and his scenes with Batman were very good. It, it was Michael Rosenbaum who, who voiced him. Yep. And I tell you what, I thought he did a really good job. Didn't he? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But come on, what about the Green Lantern? The Green Lantern, His what about it? His story was fantastic. Come on, it had to be the strongest one. I think it was the strongest one. You know, you know what, I, I, will, I will concede. Yeah. I think it was a very strong storyline. You know, the, the best thing about it was that it accomplished a sense of tragedy, which I didn't think the film was going to accomplish because it had such little prior development. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the, uh, the voice talent, you, you liked the voice talent? Yes, I, I did. We had Kevin Conroy as Batman, mm -hmm. Tim Daly as Superman, Nathan Fillion as the Green Lantern. We had uh, Carl Lumley as the Martian, Susan Eisenberg as 
Wonder Woman and Michael Rosenbaum as The Flash. That's right, and they all accomplished, I thought they all did a very good job, except I thought the script didn't allow them to use the full extent of their super vocal powers. Yeah, I thought Olivia Diabo, who voiced the Star oh. Sapphire character, was actually really awful. Yeah. Which is sad, because she has a huge vocal background. Right, She's she done voices for Generator Rex, Rex, for Star Wars, The Clone Wars, yes. and indeed I mean, Green Lantern First Flight, where she Which played, played Carol Farris, the same character. That's so right. that that was a bit weird. Yeah. Come on, Ray, rate it for me. Okay, unfortunately I'm going to be pretty harsh. Uh, I thought that uh, the fans will probably get some fluffy entertainment out of it. Yes. Newcomers probably won't get much from it at all. I thought there were too many characters to try and cover in 72 minutes. Yeah. It just felt, felt too heavy and light at the same time. Uh, I don't know, it just, I expected a lot more from it and it didn't deliver. So I'm going to have to say bury it. Oh, that's hard. No. Look, yes, it is. <laughs> no. Look, yes, it's very kitschy, but it's also kind of funny. It's got that nostalgia to it. Yeah. I didn't mind the static animation. Like I said, it takes me a little bit of a trip, but mm. it is very kitsch. I mean, when the Legion is rising out of the swamp, all I could hear in my brain was, Meanwhile, Meanwhile at, at the, the Legion, Legion of, of Doom. Doom.